Pastor, for allowing me to share some reflections about our trip to the um, I went there with my youngest son, Greg and Shelby, who's here today. Do you mind standing up, Greg, please? And this is my chance today to share some of the photos that we took because I can talk a lot, but nothing shows the people the way a photo does. And I'm going to speak about our experiences. I'm going to try very hard not to cry. I have no guarantees. And uh, so one of the questions I always get is, well, why did you go? Um, this was not in any way a vacation. <laughs> uh, we went to represent you. We went to represent the Covenant Church uh, for a big celebration they were having of 75 years of their own Covenant denomination there. And that's one of the things I love about the Covenant. They empower people to do what they need to do. And it's just a wonderful work, as you will see. And then we went to see the beginnings of the work of the Covenant Kids Congo. And I think as you came in, you got a brochure that tells just a little introduction about that program. So we went and saw the beginnings of that program, and I'm so excited. Um, in October, we will have one of the people who went on the trip with me, who's in charge of this program, come and explain further and about how you can help. So of the 187 countries listed on the uh, United Nations Index, Congo is the poorest of the poor. Getting there was a big challenge. <laughs> we flew out of Portland, and as you can see, hopefully, went all the way to Kinshasa. I, I could speak for an hour just on our airport experience. <laughs> you knew you were in the third world upon arrival. I, they didn't even really have lights at the airport when we arrived. And so from there, we uh, traveled a short distance to a guest house. And, you know, it was below a Motel 6, but believe me, by the time we left, I thought it was a five-star hotel, <laughs> given what we later saw. And then we slept about five hours and then uh, got on another plane, uh, Congo Airlines. And as we were traveling to Congo, I kept getting warnings from the U.S. Embassy, do not fly on Congo Airlines. But it was fine. It was actually really good. And then when we arrived, we uh, started going to uh, Gemini. He's always directing me on my Bengala. Uh, uh, and as you can see, this is typical of the roads. And one of our cars got stuck, and we pulled it out. Um, these people have nothing. But the next picture show how important it was for your representatives to go there. There is a group of about 15 of us. And as we're driving into town where the celebration is going to be, this was the throng that was waiting for us. And as you can see, we couldn't drive any further as we're getting closer and closer to the village. So we had to get out, and we must have sh shaken thousands of hands as we walked into the village. And so they uh, had us go up and stand on the front of the church steps, and they had uh, young girls perform and singers and just a, a wonderful greeting of love. And then the next day, we participated in the celebration. Before we left, my son kept saying, what are we doing there? And to be honest, I didn't know. So the next day, I knew we were going to celebration, but I didn't know it was going to be like this. There were over 8,000 people 
who came to worship God. Amen. It was a, a true celebration. Um, none of you should ever complain about a service in the United States or never complain about Pastor David because he has never once spoke for eight and a half hours. <laughs>
Uh, of course, you were always aware that we were in a, a different world. Um, as part of the celebration, uh, a number of dignitaries, very high up dignitaries in the Congo government came because honestly, CEUM is doing more to help people than the government is. Uh, there's been, the police haven't been paid, school teachers haven't been paid, and the covenant is stepping in and doing wonderful works, as we'll talk about. But whenever a dignitary would get up to speak, here would come the guys with the AK-47s. And it just gives you a little bit of a frightening feeling because what if something went wrong? But the people were so gracious, they just sat there quietly and listened to what everybody had to say. Uh, this was one of the most moving moments for me. Um, the second day of the celebration, a pygmy tribe arrived. And they had come 250 miles via bicycle to be part of the family of God. <laughs> now, so often in the United States, we hear people say, I believe in God, but I don't see any point in going to church. Well, that's not biblical, is it? But to these people, belonging to something is so important because so often their life is so short. So as these very tired, hungry people, as you can see, the one very disabled man walked in. The whole crowd stood and applauded. And it was like now that the last tribe had arrived, their family was complete. And I just, I hope I'm conveying a little bit of the feeling. So these tired people sang for us, and I'll tell you the Pig Deep Tribe has a very unique harmony. It's not four point, it's not five point. I don't know what it is, and I love to sing. Uh, but they sang, and we all clapped. Always, always, for the eight hours, these children would be watching. So it's the adults that are sitting there in the big crowd in the seats, and outside were the children. So um, as we, as the delegates from the United States, were leaving, we sat outside on one mosquito-infested night in the dark uh, with the president of the Congo, uh, and he asked us for honest feedback about our experience, and it was all great except we, we expressed a desire that the children be able to participate in some way. As you can see, they want to. So, I love this uh, proverb. Children are the reward of life. What a smile. <laughs> So this was communion, and just like offering, it was it, it took hours for everybody to go up and get their communion. It was quite quite moving. And finally, we would eat. <laughs> and as you can see, people would rush to be the first in line um, for the food, and the food was unique. I I remember sitting down uh, with the journalist who went with us and he and Greg and I were sitting together and he said, uh, Greg, there's teeth in this. <laughs> and then he said, and there's a tongue in this. And so we asked what it was and, and they called it uh, jungle food. And what we learned was it's called simbaliki, the best meat, they told us, the best meat. It's really a very large rat um, that they like to eat. And of course, I ate eel. Only knew it was ill afterwards. <laughs> so
So I'm going to talk briefly about the journey to transformation. Um, you'll hear more when either Rashida or Adam come and speak with us. So uh, one of the things that we're trying to do in partnership with World Vision is help with the water. Um, most families have to walk two miles every day to get some water. And as you can imagine, just doing that alone makes it very difficult for people to go to school or engage in um, activity, economic uh, development, or things like that. And uh, because it's so hard, often people resort to maybe going to the river where definitely the water is not safe. And I'm not saying that I would drink this water, but uh, all of the water that we drink um, was filtered. So one day um, we went to go see the different projects that were, we are involved in the Congo, and one was the water. And this is a spring, and they seem amazed that the spring has been going on for 12 years. But for any of you who know about geology, we know there must be rivers running right underneath that could be and should be tapped into so that more people can get good water to drink. So we asked the people, because wherever we went, a huge group of people, usually kids, because they love Greggies like the Pipe Piper, um, would gather. And so we said, how many of you get water from this well? And they all raised their hands. This man owns the well. He doesn't charge anybody to take the water and was quite proud of the 12 years this well has been running. So before we left, we prayed. I love this picture. I mean, kids peek everywhere, don't they? So one kid is really praying and one is kind of peeking and one's just boldly looking at us. <laughs> Three out of four people have no access to Um, this was the hospital, and it broke my heart. Um, I'm a medical defense attorney, and I'll tell you that one of the good things that comes from that is we get the best possible care. I'll be blunt. I know who the really good doctors are, and we know where to go. The, the hospital was atrocious. Um, and it's simply because they have no funding. Look at those mattresses. How old do you think they might be? This is the radiology department. Um, because electricity is so limited, they only do x-rays on Thursdays. So if you fractured your hip or whatever, you are going to have to wait until they can do the x-ray on a Thursday, if the generator is running. Um, this is the roof right above the people I just showed you. Uh, this girl's feet really do match her violet dress. And I had to apologize to the doctor who was leading us through the hospital. I said, I feel awful taking pictures here, but it's my hope that it's going to make a difference. And he said, take pictures, please. Show people. Um, I was meeting with an emergency department physician this weekend. I showed him this picture and said, what's going on with the legs? And he told me, oh my goodness, uh, what they've done is they've painted her legs with something called Jensen Violet, which we haven't used in the United States since the 50s. And it's because they have no antibiotics. It's to treat the infection. Most of the kids and others that come to the hospital die of problems that are easily treatable including malnutrition and malaria.
Okay. <laughs> um, I don't care what your political persuasion might be, you have to love Michelle Obama, right? <laughs> so I loved her speech this week and how she said, my most important role is to be mom in chief. And I'm so corny, I'm clapping like she's going to hear me or something. <laughs> So, uh, one of my most important roles has been to be mom in chief for my kids. And it doesn't matter if they're over 18. I mean, it's not a magical moment when they turn 18 and you don't feel like a mom anymore. So, Gregory's now 19. And sometimes all you can do for your kids is pray for them. Uh, try and provide some good experiences. And um, a few years back, um, I saw on Greg's Facebook page that he was agnostic. And so I challenged him probably not in a good way about that, and I was no longer his Facebook friend. <laughs> um, but the truth is, we've all struggled with faith. Am I right? We've all felt that way. So we went on this trip, and <laughs> sorry, Greg, <laughs> you didn't know I was going to do this. Um, my son became so so sick, and you might have I don't know if you've seen this in. And so I'm, of course, thinking Ebola, but he was really sick. <clears throat> and so he said to me, because every day we would gather and we'd eat and share about what had happened. And um, so he's sick in his room. And he said to me, would you ask him for prayer? That request was an answer to my prayer. And we prayed. And there was a physician assistant who was part of our group. And she said, I'll come back in a few hours and check on Greg. And she came back and he was worse. And I, I just didn't know what to do. And she said, well, we've got to give him an ID. And so she was gone some time. I didn't know why. And she finally came back and put an ID up. And then Greg had to go to the bathroom to wretch again. <laughs> so he goes to the bathroom. And he has extreme pain and basically passed out, was hyperventilating. There's IVs everywhere, blood's coming out. Thank goodness the PA was still there. And we got him into bed. And uh, she said, you know, we've tried to give him Phenergan during the day, but he's kept throwing it up. And I'm really concerned about him, because if we don't get a handle on this, you're not going to be able to complete your trip. So she said, I'm, I'm going to see if I can get a shot to get him. And uh, she didn't come back for a really long time. And then she came back and she had a shot, she gave it to him. And we still had a really, really, it's the worst night of my life, really bad. Uh, but we got through it and then the next day he slept for the eight hours I was sitting in service. And uh, throughout the day, people would come and check on Greg to make sure he, how is he doing. And so I came and there was a missionary wife there and um, I was sharing with her about Greg just generally. And she said, do you know how that prayer was answered? She said the PA was gone so long because there wasn't a single needle in the hospital that could give Greg a shot. So she came over to our house and was sharing how Greg needed a shot. 
in Delhi, this woman said, well, two needles came in the crate with bread from some donation. And it was not the kind of needles that they could use in the hospital, but it was exactly the kind of needle that the PA needed to give Greg a shot. So, um, I will say Greg represented you really, really well. Um, I was so proud of him. He, he perked up. Uh, he was wonderful with the kids. He um, participated in basketball ministry. Um, the day that we were walking in, this little boy, Cephas, runs up to Greg and says, basketball? <laughs> and so then we learned that Pastor David Williams, who's a missionary there, was um, had started a basketball ministry. So, of course, Greg had to participate. This is Pastor David Williams from Fort Collins, Colorado, in the middle. He doesn't speak hardly any Lindau, but he's pretty good with a whistle. <laughs> Notice the feet on these basketball players. Most of them are barefooted or in flip-flops. Kind of hard to play basketball, but his church is donating shoes for them. There's Greg. Um, when we left the court that day, they treated him like Michael Jordan. <laughs> there was a huge crowd, and our friend Cephas was getting a little bit jealous, I must say. So there's Greg and his friend Cephas, and they're still corresponding. Um, better with Madeline, Greg's girlfriend, because she speaks French. And they speak French as well. So, what are the challenges for this mom and chief? Large, even to get into that bed, to go to the hospital to get any triage, it costs three hundred. I mean, three dollars and fifty cents. So if you're making three hundred dollars a year, that seems almost impossible. Then it's another dollar to see a doctor. So for the cost of a latte. Many kids do not get any care at all. Uh, the other project that we're working on is education in literacy. Uh, we visited the first child that's going to be part of this program that you feel more, hear more about. Um, it's a sponsorship where for $40 you can sponsor a child. The money does not go directly to the child. It goes to the community for health care and education and water and economic development in hopes that it will help everybody in the community. But this little girl, Maggie, was the first one to be registered in the Covenant Kids. Number one, she's called. And of all the kids we met, she was the least friendly. <laughs> when we arrived, she, the only white people she had seen were ones who gave her shots. So she was not inclined to be happy at all. Um, but we sat with this family and another family for a while, and uh, their hopes and dreams are the same as ours. That their children will grow up happy and healthier, well-educated, that their life will not be as hard as their lives. We asked if Maggie was going to be able to go to school, and the father expressed hope that she could, but it was $4 a month to attend school, so he's not quite certain. Oh, that's the president there praying from uh, Kenya, Simon. And he's praying in a place that's providing education for women. Uh, that's a key. Uh, if you have at least an eighth grade education, your chances of succeeding are very high compared to others. Economic development, um, you know, even when we go to conventions, there's vendors outside 
These were the vendors outside the celebration selling their oranges, but in Congo, oranges are green. So because of the ravages of the war, uh, the equipment, the economy is very, I mean, much of what you see is from the 80s, like this tractor or the books that I saw in the hospital. The newest book was dated 1983 in English when the doctors spoke French. So how can you help? Use me. You know, I strongly believe that I was there for a purpose. So I'm willing to speak anytime, anywhere, to anybody about this experience in hopes that I can help just one of those kids. Don't hesitate to use me. Look at the love as this woman looks at me. I think that's one of the oldest people that we saw, and she's probably my age. So for everyone to whom much is given, of him much is required. So I ask you, how many of you in this room were able to flush your toilet this morning? Or flick on light and the light came on? Or for the adults, how many of you make more than $300 a year? So we may think we don't have much, but much has been given to us. And there's something we can do. If not for this, for something else, give it yourself. Do what God has asked us to do. Second, begin praying for the Congo. Educate yourself. Uh, if you did not get one, these pamphlets are back there, and there's this covenant address so that you can look up and see all the things that are going on. There are kids' projects. Um, I was so excited to hear from Bertie that we're already making advantages. Is that right, Bertie, for the people who are working? God works in mysterious ways. I had no idea. That's just yes. awesome. So needed. Finally, attend Hope Sunday. Um, we will be having a Hope Sunday in October where one of my friends that was on the trip with me will come and she will provide more details. And honestly, I can't wait. So thank you very much for allowing me to share. And hopefully Greg forgives me about that awful picture. Thank <laughs> you.